speakers. So please join me in welcoming John Thorne. As has been mentioned, it's very appropriate we meet in Chicago, which is another one-party, semi-authoritarian state, yearning to breathe free. <laughs> um, John Tillman knows that I come to Illinois frequently, and I've often told him that he should not despair. Everyone in life serves a useful purpose, even in the case of Illinois, if it's just to be a bad example to the other 49 states. And you may already know that I have done some books on voter fraud, which of course Chicago has made famous over the years. And I'll never forget my first trip to Chicago to investigate voter fraud. Um, the former clerk, uh, who later went to uh, well, extend to stay in public housing courtesy of the federal prosecutors, uh, had gotten out and he was explaining how voter fraud really worked from the inside. So I asked him, well, do you think there's any reform that might actually go through in Chicago? And he said, well, you need to do something catchy. We did get the clerk, the clerk of the court, which the clerk of the election board was shaken up a few years ago because some people got tired of all the dead people voting in Chicago. So they started to campaign no representation without respiration. <laughs> but I suspect that Chicago will continue its innovative ways in voter fraud for quite some time. And frankly, I just always tell foreign visitors, do not take those lessons back from the United States to your own country. Um, my talk is going to be very anecdotal because I had a flood of memories when Brad asked me to discuss the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Some of them involved Atlas. Um, I will always be appreciative to Atlas because I think it was 1986, almost my first public speech as a journalist was to an Atlas in Indianapolis, Indiana that Anthony Fisher still was able to attend at that point. And I got to know a little bit about Atlas, which was in its nascent early form then. And since then, I have admired from afar how it's grown to the network that you saw in the video, 400 organizations around the world. And the thing that always has inspired me about Atlas is it's easy to be against despots, it's easy to be against authoritarian regimes, against totalitarian regimes. You know, the sad lot of humankind is that the vast majority of people on our planet for the vast majority of the time we've had recorded civilization have lived under such despots and authoritarian and totalitarian regimes. It's easy to be against those vi gross violations of human rights. It's a lot harder to, be, to know what you're for. And you know, there are vague terms out there like democracy and freedom and free speech and all of that. But Atlas puts muscle and sinew on the bones of what a real free society is all about. And not only does it help for groups that are often opposing those kind of totalitarian regimes, but it gives them a real set of tried and true practiced steps, the rule of law, free markets, exchange of goods and people, uh, peace, and it is able to provide them with a program that stands the test of time. And wherever it has been tried, rigorously and consistently, it has brought prosperity, freedom, and frankly, a better life for the vast majority of people at the bottom of our societies. <laughs> the other memory that came cascading back to me was a memory specific to the Berlin Wall. I will never forget the summer of 89. I was temporarily stationed for nine months at the Wall Street Journal's office in Brussels, so I got to travel around Eastern Europe a great deal during that tumultuous summer and spring. And it was a great opportunity. I did not know when the communist regimes would fall, but I did know they were in trouble. I will never forget, um, for a variety of unusual circumstances, I had lunch with the Deputy Chief of Mission at the East German Embassy in Washington, Peter Jans, and he was always trying to convince me to come to East Germany on a government-sponsored in-tourist tour to see the real East Germany. And I said, well, I've seen them on television, that's enough for me, actually. Um, so he was trying to convince me the summer of 1989 that I had to go to the 40th anniversary of the German Democratic Republic, the DDR, the East Germany. 
And he said, you really have to come. It's in October. The weather will be good. All of our celebrities from the international communist world will be there. Yasser Arafat, Angela Davis, Chris Christopherson. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. There were, a lot of, there were a lot of commies then who no longer want to remember the thing, what they were back then. And finally, I just couldn't take it anymore. And I said, and you know, I, I basically bluffed. I said, well, you know, my sources in the US government say I really should also come to your 40th anniversary in October. And he said, yes. And I said, yes, because they assure me that there will not be a 41st anniversary. <laughs> and I will never forget the expression of his face. His eyes popped. And he looked stunned. And of course, I looked at this expression of his face, and I knew I had to bluff some more. So I said, yes, you know, there are deep fissures inside your society and inside your internal government. A great deal of dissension in the Politburo. And he sort of nods, and then he stops nodding because he realizes he's affirming what I was telling him. And then he, then, he, then he pauses, and there's this long pause of about two minutes, which is an eternity. And then he sits there and he says, John, may I ask you a question off of the books? And I said, sure, I guess that means off the record. So he says, John, if someday someone from an entity, an institution, were to come to you and say, tell us about Harry Hans and how he represented East Germany. Tell us about his work and how he conducted himself. What would you say? And I said, well, uh, I would say that you conducted yourself professionally. Uh, as far as I know, you never told me a direct lie. You never told me the complete truth, of course, but you never told me a direct lie that I know of. And to the best of your ability, uh, while you sugarcoated the regime, uh, you did not deny uh, all, of its fault, any, all of its faults and never pretended that uh, the United States was um, a malevolent force trying to take over the world or anything like that. You, you did the best you could with a very bad script. And that was about as good a half-hearted endorsement as I could make, not making him feel too bad. And he leaned over to me, he grabbed me by the forearm here, and he said, thank you. <laughs> and it was that moment that I knew something was happening. Because what he was basically saying is, if the West Germans ever come to you and ask about me, what are you going to tell them? <laughs> anyway, that summer and fall were fascinating. I got arrested in four communist countries. <laughs> there was a small part of me that was a little regretful when the wall fell because I was trying to collect them all, collect all the communist countries and be arrested in them. But in reality, what I had discovered was during the summer and fall of 1989, since I was a journalist for the Wall Street Journal, I knew there was only so much they could do to me because of the prominence of the publication, not mine. I knew that they were, at that point, more scared of me than I was scared of them. That was the tipping point. So what happened that fall surprised me, but it didn't shock me. Now, go back five years, and this is where my real story begins. It was summer of 84, George Orwell's 1984, and I was in East Berlin on a visit, and I had a friend who worked at the American Embassy. Um, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, it was the West German Mission to Berlin uh, at the time, and he was an American citizen who was working for the Germans. And unlike my own rather poor conversational German, I can understand a lot. I can't necessarily write an article or have extended conversation. Um, he was fluent in German. So we went over to the Museum of German History. And Tom Palmer, I believe, has been there. He knows that wonderful place. The Museum of German History in East Berlin was a fascinating place. You learned things that you didn't learn anywhere else. You learned that television had been invented by an East German in 1956. <laughs> you learned that the moon landing was faked uh, by the United States. I didn't realize that even. Uh, you learned a whole bunch of things. Conspiracy theories galore. And while we were there in the Museum of German History, a little voice piped up and said, Excuse me, do you have the time? And we looked around, and there were these little girls, maybe 14, 15 years old, uh, teenagers. And they wanted to know the time from us. Well, it was rather bizarre, because we saw they had wristwatches. <laughs> and clearly, this was a pretext to sort of talk to us. And so we started chatting with them. And we asked them, how did you know we were from the West? Because they were from a small town outside of Berlin, near Magdeburg. They had never been to their capital. This was the first visit to the big city. How in the world did they know we were from the West? And they said, well, it's simple. We looked at your shoes. They weren't made of plastic. <laughs> that, 
was the good one. So we chatted with him amiably, and then suddenly this voice, this very sharp centurion voice, came and said, it is time to go, immediately. <laughs> and this was like the figure out of, this was like Nurse Ratchet out of one floor of the Christmas <laughs> This was a very forbidding person. It was their teacher, and she obviously knew we were a subversive element with these school kids, so it was time to go. So two hours elapse, we continue our tour of East Berlin. We go into Centrum Warenhaus, which is the main department store in East Berlin. If you want to know what the main department store in East Berlin was like back then, it was Kmart without any inventory. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly, in the department store, we run across the four teenage girls again. Turns out their teacher was not as disciplined a party member as she might have pretended to be. She'd gone off for the day on her own shopping expedition and let the students go. So we got to chat with them, and we decided, since we knew East Berlin better than they did, this was their first trip to their own capital, we'd give them the tour of their capital. And we did. We took them everywhere, bought them ice cream, showed, showed them our passports, and they showed, them, uh, they showed us their Ausweise, their residence papers, their pass. And uh, we walked the whole streets for all the afternoon and the early evening. Great day. Then in the early evening, we decided, well, it's time to go back, and obviously they had to go back to their uh, hostel or wherever they were staying. It was an early curfew. So we said, well, we're going to leave uh, at, um, we're going to leave at Checkpoint Charlie, and we started walking towards there. That was one of the main exits, the corridors. They had never seen the wall. They had been in Berlin the whole day. They'd never seen the wall. But intuitively, they knew we were coming up on it because they started walking more and more slowly. And we finally stopped just as we got outside of the wall, and it was two blocks away. And we, they just stopped at the street corner and said, you know, we've been told we shouldn't get right up to the wall because they'll start asking us questions why we're there, so we'll just leave you here. And I stood there on that street corner with this incredible, ineffable feeling of sadness coming over me. Because I was not a rich person, but for $500, I could travel anywhere in the world from that street corner. I had that freedom. Price of a plane ticket. They, no matter how much money they had, couldn't go another 50 feet, 50 yards, or even from that street corner. So we just s stood there and made idle conversation. I didn't want the moment to end. So I asked each of these four teenage girls, what did they want to be when they grew up in East Germany? And one said a beautician, and one said a school teacher, and one said a nurse. And the oldest and wisest was named Monica. And Monica looked up at me. I'll never forget the sadness in her eyes. And she said, you know, it doesn't make any difference what we do when we grow up. They are always going to treat us as children. That hit me. That hit me. And we exchanged addresses and small talk. We gave them whatever Easter remarks we had left over from the day that we couldn't spend. And we departed. And over the next five years, I think Monica um, a couple of the others of us, you know, would send postcards back and forth, and they were growing up, of course. Well, November 9th, 1989 came, the fall of the wall, and I was watching it on television in my office in New York. It happened about 1 o'clock New York time, the first rumblings, and then by 4 o'clock it was obvious what was happening. And I went to home that night, and I woke up the next morning, and I said to myself, as I turned on the television, and there were all these crowds of people filling the streets of Berlin, I said, I wonder if Monica's in that crowd. And a half hour later, the phone rings, and it's a long distance call, and it's Monica. It turns out AT&T, great capitalist company, already knew that these people coming over the wall were potential consumers. <laughs> and so they immediately had wheeled up phone trucks and portable <laughs> phone stations into the main squares, Potsdamer Platz and various other places, and they were offering one free call anywhere in the world to any East German who was walking by to test their wares. So Monica had a phone, and she decided to call me, and the first words were, John, this is Monica, I'm over the wall. And it was an amazing moment. And I said to myself, wow. So I immediately took over, took out my notes, and I knew an article was here somewhere. And it later appeared in the Reader's Digest as well as the Wall Street Journal. 
So I asked her after 10 minutes or so of pleasantries, I said, I reminded her of the conversation we had on that street corner five years before, and I reminded her that she had been refused admission into university because she had been a troublemaker. And I reminded her that she was now going to be entering a whole new society, a whole new set of challenges. And I said, Monica, you said it didn't matter what you became when you grew up. They still treat you as children. Do you still feel that way now? That was my journalist question. And she said, boy, was she smart. She said, you know, I think my whole country has gone from kindergarten to high school overnight. And I think now I will be able to go to university. And she was. She became a veterinarian later. Um, that was amazing. Affirmation of the faith that you have in freedom. There's one small coda, though. A few years later, she and her fiance were coming to California, where I'm from originally, and I happened, was going to happen to be there on a visit, and she asked me to show her around the Bay Area, also up in Sacramento, where I graduated from high school. And she wanted to address a class of American students. And I was a little hesitant because I go back to my old high school and speak every four years or so because that's a whole generation. You know, by the time you go back every four years, the freshmen have become seniors and gone on. And every time I would go back about every four years, I would be a little bit more disquieted about the state of education of the public schools in California and a little bit more, more worried about the kind of lack of connection that a lot of those students had to practical realities and basic knowledge even. But I agreed to do it. We picked an AP advanced placement class in civics, and she came in to talk about her experience in East Germany. And maybe it was a bad day, maybe it was a bad class, maybe it was the teacher who wasn't good at discipline, but people were talking through her little presentation. Um, there was some disrespect, the, the minds were wandering. And when she finished, she asked for questions, and the girl raised her hand and said, I just don't understand. Why would somebody build a wall down the middle of a city? Why would they do that? She just clearly had no understanding of what had happened and just a few years before. And the questions after that weren't much better. So afterwards, I went up to Monica and I tried to, tripped over myself apologizing, saying, you know, all these, we'll do another class another time. And she says, stop, no, no. She says, John, you don't have to understand. Look, I understand something in this country. I've been here two weeks. You've never lost your freedom. You've never lost your freedom. You've never been occupied. You've never had a foreign force take over your country. You don't appreciate fully, for that reason, what you have. And therefore, you've grown a little lazy and a little flabby. I'm embroidering a little bit of what she said. And then she went on to say, it's all right, but I do worry about these kids. Because what they're learning here, no matter what they learn, they may still in the future think like children. And that really hurt. That really hurt. Because freedom isn't just the obvious manifestations of totalitarianism. It can be imprisoned, in, you can be imprisoned in your own mind. I think one of the biggest problems we've had in American education the last 40, 50 years at least has been there's been an active movement among people directing our educational system to dumb things down, to make sure people don't think for themselves, and to put people in certain grooves and certain patterns of conformity to the system, to authority. That's why I think the school choice movement that I know John Tillman and others of you in this room are so active and is so important. We can't let people graduate from our schools thinking like children and not having the maturity beyond being that of a child in some cases. Because truly, as Ronald Reagan reminded us, we're only one generation away from losing everything that our founding fathers gave us as a birthright. You can't communicate freedom through the bloodstream, you can't communicate it through uh, nor normal processes. You have to inculcate it in each generation. And frankly, if you go to our high schools today, they're not teaching civics, they're not teaching American history, they're not teaching a whole lot of things. They're teaching many esoteric and interesting things that may be of use to people, but certainly not what we were taught in school. And I think that's very frightening for us. Now, I'll close with this, because, you know, the story never ends. 
no matter how much you could have a momentous event like the fall of communism, the need to overturn dictatorships and authoritarian regimes continues. Ukraine, which I'm going to later this month, I'm giving a speech in Kiev. In February, as you know, there were people shot on the Maidan, shot and killed, including friends of our earlier speaker. Well, I'll just leave you with this, because this was a fascinating event. The President Yanukovych fled in his helicopter early Saturday morning, but by Friday he had lost the support of the media and the security services because, as one Ukrainian told me, he had simply run out of murderers. There were not enough people left in his regime who would murder and accept the possible consequences of a regime following and they having to call, be taken into account for their actions. On Friday evening, the day, the morning before the Yanukovych fled his helicopter, there was a, a show on Inter, which is, I guess, the most watched Ukrainian network. Lydia Pankev, a 24-year-old television journalist, was invited on by the host, Mr. Danilevich, to discuss the need for reconciliation following the killings in the streets. While reporting on the Maidan, Pankiv, the 24-year-old journalist, had helped persuade the riot police not to use further violence against the activists, and she had disclosed that one of the Berkut officers she negotiated with was now her fiancé. New, new, new heights in diplomacy. <laughs> but reconciliation was not what Pankiv wanted to discuss. So they finally turned her on this program, and she'd been prompted by the producers, your message is reconciliation between the government of Yanukovych and the streets. But she had a different message. Here's what she said. You probably want to hear a story from me about how with my bare hands I restrained a whole Berkut unit of riot police, and one of the Berkut officers fell in love with me and I fell in love with him. But I'm going to tell you another story about how with my bare hands I dragged the bodies of those killed the day before yesterday, and about how two of my friends died yesterday. I hate Yanukovych and all of his people and all those who carry out their criminal orders. I came here today on this channel only because I found out this is a live broadcast and you cannot edit me. I want to say that I also despise Inter, this television network I'm speaking on, because for three months it has deceived viewers and spread enmity among citizens of this country. And now you are calling for peace and reconciliation? Yes, you have the right to try to clear your consciences as media whores, but I think you should run this program on your knees. I have brought these photos here for you of victims so that you can see my dead friends and your dreams and understand that you also took part in that. And now I'm sorry, I don't have time for this anymore. I'm going to Maidan. Glory to Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what should inspire all of us throughout the world, no matter how desperate and how dire the conditions are, people cannot see within them the light of freedom extinguished. It lives on. And for the fact that Atlas is here helping and being a repository of wisdom and knowledge and training for those people can sometimes make all the difference in the world. And I salute you and thank you for coming. We have time for a few uh, questions. Um, Daniel, he has the, the mic. Wow. wow. I'm I'm sure you've got already. Hi, my name is Ed Anderson from California. I know a lot about the schools there, and I wish every student in America could hear this speech. This is terrific. It brought tears to my eyes. Tom's got a question. When you were in a variety of countries and talking to people, what was your impression of the expectation of what would come after communism? It varied from place to place. Could you walk through some of the, the range of anticipations that people had? Well, I, for the average person who wasn't doing a lot of reading, uh, I would say it was, the expectation was from Hollywood movies a much better materialistic style of life. A car, uh, an apartment where the plumbing worked, <laughs> things like that, basics. But if you went beyond those expectations, I think many of them had a sense, especially from foreigners who had gone through their country as tourists and they'd had some brief conversations with them, 
the ability to read whatever they wanted, to express themselves, to ask questions, the ability to ask questions and not to be silenced, whether it's by a teacher who simply says you should study by the book, or whether by it's an official, or whether by even a parent who was adopting the same authoritarian style of home as they were experienced in the society. So I think that they didn't have a fully formed sense of what the alternative was, but they knew that what they had was brutal, conformist, and limited. And you know, how many of you have seen the movie The Lives of Others, which is the story about the East German Stasi? You know, I met somebody who had been in the Stasi, and this was at a conference at Hohenschirnhausen, which is the Stasi prison in Berlin, and they had a reunion, of a manner of speaking, between Stasi agents and political prisoners. And one of the political prisoners said something very interesting. They said, the lives of others, that movie, which won, by the way, the Academy Award for Best Foreign Film, the lives of others is the only film they've ever seen that portrayed the actual day-to-day -day reality of an authoritarian, totalitarian regime. And I said, well, what do you define daily day reality? And they said, lots of gray, lots of brown, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of sheer bone-crushing, mind-numbing tedium, punctuated by occasional moments of sheer terror. <laughs> that's totalitarianism. And I think that's what people really knew they didn't want. They were bored, they had, they had no potential to fulfill that which was the best within them in their life, and they knew there must be something better out there. And they knew that some other countries operated under a different system. And even if they didn't know all the details of that system, they wanted at least that. Yes? John, one of the great challenges uh, uh, when these uh, inflection points come is that the, those who are, are tyrannical are willing to use force in the most brutal way. And those fighting for freedom go to a square and protest with very limited power other than the power of the crowd, which is hard to generate. How do we, what can we do different to try to empower these movements at these inflection points to take on those willing to use brute force? I don't know the answer, but I do know, I'll make a couple observations. I think, and I've talked to people who used to be in some of these regimes, they know now about the outside world, and they fear coverage of the protests in the streets. They fear the consequences of what if the regime will fall? What will it mean for me personally as someone who's a general, a secret policeman, um, a torturer? And they have to factor that into the equation. We now know that the East German Revolution in 1989 came this close to having troops firing on the crowds in Leipzig. And we now have traced it back to one Stasi general who said to himself, I have calculated the odds, and the odds are not good enough for me to be the man responsible for issuing that order tonight. I will not issue, issue the order to shoot, because I may be responsible for answering to that. And you know what? Three weeks later, the regime fell, so he was right. In Ukraine, regardless of how it happened, and I don't know all the details, it was astonishing to see how quickly the regime melted away when they ran out of murderers. And frankly, after 88 people had been killed in the Maidan, there were a lot of people who say, this is what we are here for, to shoot our own people in the streets. Maybe some of us are, some of us who have the foreign bank accounts, but not the average policeman on the street, unless he's a trained thug. So on the other side of the Maidan, the protesters, they know with the social media, and Tom Palmer knows this better than almost anyone, Twitter, Facebook, all of these devices that can mobilize people and get people to a central place, are incredibly powerful. I think one of the most positive elements we saw was, even in Turkey, where the, the forces of authoritarianism are growing by the day, the high court there finally said, banning Twitter has gone too far, and now Twitter is back in operation. Let's hope YouTube is next. These devices can't guarantee you success, but they give you the opportunity for success that dissidents and people fighting totalitarian regimes have seldom had in our histories. A question in the middle of the... Um, I'm, I'm hoping that you will be able to come up with something optimistic about our young people, and I just wanted to share one experience with you. I was the, in the first class that went back to teach at Georgia Tech after 911, and I didn't know what I was walking into, so I just walked into my class, which was probably about a third immigrants, and I said, we don't know yet what has happened, but we are told that this has happened because somebody hates America. 
so much to kill. And there's a chance that we're going to go to war over this. I just want to have a discussion today about what America means to all of you and what you would die for. I asked that in two classes. And student after student in different kind, with different kinds of um, accents and color and so on, they said the following thing. They said, America means to me that I'm free, and I'm free to follow my own dreams. But more importantly, I get to live with other people who are also free and follow their own dreams. And I hang on, when I, when I despair about our young people and being a college teacher, I do, I hang on to that moment and, and find that there are so many um, yearnings and understanding of freedom out there. And I wonder if you can share, I know you have seen some too. Well, let me correct a misimpression I may have given you. I wasn't so much criticizing the young people as I was criticizing what they weren't being taught or exposed to. One of the things I have learned in speaking to a lot of young audiences is, you know, all of these films and videos and books that you put out and the radio talk shows that you may hear in which Mark Levin or Michael Medved discusses American history and constitutional <coughs> theory, they really do get to a lot of young people because they're, they're, it's like a parched desert out there. They finally hear stuff about the Constitution, the founding fathers, the basic principles of the country. They, they, they snap it up. I mean, yes, there's a lot of junk on the History Channel. Yes, there's a lot of junk on cable television. But there are also incredibly good documentaries that are now available for free on YouTube. I see young people all the time refer to these things because they weren't the kind of things they were taught in school, but they're finding them on their own. And that's one of the great things Atlas can do. It's basically a private online university for many people in many countries, communicating things that will never be they'll never be exposed to in the public schools there. I think maybe one more. Thanks so much. Um, just kind of dovetailing on your about education. I brought my daughter here because she's on spring break and God bless. <laughs> yes. And um, she goes to a, a high school. But one of the questions that another mother told me was asked of her of her child in the classroom was, "What right are you willing to give up for the safety?" And this came right after um, like a gun control sure. sort of. And what do, would you say? I mean, I, stuff like this is wonderful. Atlas Online Policy, but. Um, what can parents do, I mean, in your perspective, to to change stuff like this? I mean, you, besides getting the curriculum, now with Common Core coming down the pike, um, it just seems more of like a dumbing down. And you know, Common Core has just been defeated in Tennessee and in Indiana and in Louisiana. I met with Governor Jindal yesterday. He has now come out against Common Core. He was one of the original supporters of it. So the progress is being made on that front. I don't have the answer, but I'll tell you this. Um, a lot of countries in the world, because they're very interested in education, have Saturday academies for their students. The Koreans are famous for this. The Japanese are famous for this. You know, they have the existing public school structure, but they have special academies that teach supplemental material so they can pass the entrance exams to universities. I think for, for most Americans who can't afford private school or for, don't, aren't, don't have a lot of options available to them, I think one of the things we might have to do is uh, provide, whether it's online or elsewhere, you know, Saturday academies where kids who can access this material that they don't get in public schools, and frankly, there'll be even a few public school boards that'll be shamed into actually improving their curriculum if they know there are parents organized in their neighborhood saying, we may not be able to change the school board, but we're at least offering things that we know you should be offering and aren't offering. I think there needs to be a grassroots rebellion out there, and believe me, a lot of the public school board members in this country aren't bad people, they're just inert, and they respond to pressure, and I think we have to start start pressuring them that they're not doing well by the future of this republic and the future of this free country and how they're teaching our young people. Thank you so much.